is David Amos. Uh, I'm the Member of Parliament for South End West and the Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group to the Maldives. Uh, I was elected to Parliament in 1983 and um, I've been involved with all matters concerning the Maldives for more or less two decades. Now I'm going to get my two colleagues to introduce themselves and then we're all going to make some statements about our visit and then it's over to you good people to ask us questions. Uh, my name is Ian Paisley. I'm a Member of Parliament for North Antrim in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm a member of the Democratic Unionist Party. I've been a member of the All Parliamentary Party Maldives Group since about 2010 and have tried to play a role in promoting the interests of smaller nations and understanding of smaller nations in our national parliament. I was previously a government minister in the Northern Ireland Parliament and a member of that parliament for about 13 years. And it's very good to be here in the Maldives and to meet with your parliamentarians and your people. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Menzies. I am a Conservative Member of Parliament, so from the, the same uh, party as uh, Sir David. This is my first ever trip uh, to the Maldives, but originally I'm from Scotland, which uh, is a, a small nation uh, within the United Kingdom, but I represent a constituency in the north of England. And, and what I want to, to understand firsthand is the situation on the ground in the Maldives, uh, and also to meet uh, you know, genuine, real Maldivian people. And we've had an opportunity to do that in this trip, in that we've been given access to a whole range of different people. We've walked freely in the streets and, and chatted to people um, as, as we've gone. And so it's been a very, very useful few days. I do apologise that we have brought the British weather with us. Uh, you, know, you know, United Kingdom, London in particular, is renowned for heavy rain. And uh, I apologise to all the people of the Maldives for bringing heavy rain to, your, uh, to, to Mali. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. That, that's the three of us. Now, we, we'd all like to say something about our visit here. Um, I am in love with the Maldives, and I like Maldivian people. You are peace-loving people. I'm not in the hands of any one, frankly, and I much regret that this press conference apparently has been trashed, that we're just government mouthpieces. That couldn't be further from the truth. We're here to find out at first hand what the situation is in the Maldives. Because unfortunately, your country is being portrayed, I believe, in a rather unfair fashion. And let me explain that. Uh, former President Gayoum is entirely responsible for bringing democracy to this country. And I met him when he was president. I was involved when he had the first free and fair elections. If he was corrupt and a dictator, it seems rather extraordinary that he lost the election. If he was a dictator and corrupt, he would have fiddled the election and he would have still been president. He didn't. So let's get that straight, because I think there are a lot of people uh, who are politicians throughout the world who just don't understand the history of your great country. And I applaud former President Gayoum in bringing democracy to the Maldives. That being said, um, I believe that democracy, which is hard won, needs support. You just don't introduce democracy and it happens. You need help with all the organs of state. Now, political parties like the MDP might say that things have gone badly wrong here. That isn't for me to judge, it's for you, the Maldivian people, and you've had elections since then. But the good news I bring is that the British government and the Foreign Office welcome our visiting your country. They think it's a good idea that we are engaging with you, 
and we have the letter from our foreign office minister and the uh, the um, trade and industry department saying that they are very willing to help. It could be with the judiciary, it could be with economic matters, it could cover education, it could cover health, but they're very keen to um, engage with you. Your former president, Nasheed, uh, it's no secret, is in the UK at the moment, and uh, he has made statements on a whole range of matters. I don't want to get involved in that, really, frankly. He, he, he's an advocate for himself, and I'm not going to get involved. Is, is it right what he said or, or not right he would, that he said certain things? But what I can tell you is, we went yesterday, the three of us, to Mushafi prison. And we visited um, all the categories of prisoners. So we saw the highest grade security prisons, there were 16 of them. And then we went to the prison where um, former President Nasheed was held. Now, from my perspective, having been to many UK prisons, uh, where he's being held was quite luxurious, really. There was a garden swing, there was a, a, a suite, there was television, there was a fairly comfortable bed. Uh, so all I can say is it seemed to me that as far as his incarceration was concerned, he was being treated very well. Now, that's not me getting into any argument about is it right that he's been accused of anything or not. But as you know, your former president went on the TV programme called Hard Talk, and he did admit on that TV programme that he had done things that perhaps he might have done differently in hindsight. But again, it's your law. So that's President Nasheed. We've met with your economic minister and your tourism minister. And from our perspective, we feel that it is most unhelpful for the rest of the world to be given the impression that you have 1,800 political prisoners here where your total prison population isn't even 1800 and we feel it's unhelpful for the rest of the world in terms of tourism and investment in your economy for the impression to be given that you have the highest number of terrorists per population. The prison we visited yesterday there were 15 terrorists there and there were no political prisoners. Now we have taken the trouble to see at first hand what the situation is. And we've made ourselves available to everyone who wanted to see us. So yesterday we met all the political parties and we had a very good meeting with the MDP. And during that meeting, they made a number of points that they wanted us to raise with the president. There were 16 in total. And we've given those points to the president. They've, they're all sorts of points about um, freedom, about the judiciary, about terrorism, about political prisoners, all sorts of points. And your president has promised us that he will uh, give us a reply to the points which have been made. We also discussed with your president the situation regarding his two vice presidents, which are obviously most unfortunate. We also discussed with the president the situation regarding the gentleman last night who was uh, convicted for a terrorism offence. Now, before handing over to my two colleagues, I just wanted to share this with you. We feel that the idea of 
all party talks is an excellent one. We feel that jaw jaw is better than war war. And your president has said he would welcome all party talks. I mean, we've just come from meeting him. That's what he said. And he's very happy for international observers to be present for those talks. Now, if we're going to have all party talks, you can't ransom the president and say, well, we'll only agree to these all party talks if this is done or that is done. It's got to be straightforward. These, I mean, you can raise all these issues during the all party talks, but I very much support all party talks with international observers. <clears throat> and the other thing I wanted to share with you, I feel very strongly that it would be most unwise for my country to encourage international sanctions. I think if there were international sanctions, it wouldn't damage the president or his cabinet. It would damage you, the ordinary people of the Maldives. That would be the effect of the sanction. And I'm delighted to say that your president has said to the three of us that he would very much like to meet David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, and that he would very much like to meet Philip Hammond, the British Foreign Secretary. And that is indeed what we are going to achieve when we get back to the United Kingdom. Now, I'm going to hand over to my two colleagues who are going to talk about the Friendship Group, they're going to talk about uh, religious freedoms and other ideas that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to actually want to listen to us. We do appreciate that. It's very important, so, so thank you for giving us the time. Uh, like, like Sir David, I would reiterate that anyone who knows me or knows any of us knows that we're independent people. Uh, yes, we're from different political parties. Uh, but we have independent minds. I'm particularly outspoken, most people know that about me. I call what we say in our country a spade a spade, uh, so I'm very direct in the things that I say. And if people are suggesting that uh, we are um, having our strings pulled by others, I think they don't know very much about me and certainly don't know very much about our colleagues. Um, I have a record of being outspoken. I have a record of knowing what it's like to be in jail. My father was in jail on a number of occasions for his political beliefs. Uh, so I, I know what intolerance looks like. Um, I would say right at the very beginning that this has been the most extensive visit by British parliamentarians probably ever in the history of the Maldives. And I think that uh, we have insisted on meeting all political groups. We have insisted on having no stone unturned. We insisted on visiting the prison and no one at any point in the authority uh, of governance said to us no you can't do that they said do you want to do that but they said no you can't do that and so everything was left open to us and we appreciate the transparency and the openness that has been available to us um, your country at the present time stands at a very important crossroads and uh, it can be driven down one particular crossroads and be stereotyped that it's a place of hatred, of anger, of insurrection, of Islamic f um, act activity, and that it's about to implode. Or the truth can come out that this is a peace-loving country, that this, a, this is a place of hope, this is a place that um, international people want to come and visit, as David has used the, the four-letter word, a place that people love. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, we've got to make sure that in the report that we produce after our series of meetings here, that we portray your country fairly. Because certainly we have seen a country that is ambitious, a country that is open, a country that shows toleration. And we've seen, even in all of the political parties, a recognition that economic development must be the key mover in the current climate. I would reiterate totally what David has said in terms of the talks process. In Northern Ireland, where I come from, we had 40 years of terrorism. The only way we got out of that was by having a talks process. 
and by actually moving our country forward. It was difficult. I ended up sharing power with people who tried to kill uh, my party leader. But that is the way in which you make progress in a democracy. And if the offer of talks is there, and whenever I first entered the talks process in my country, I was a minority party. By the time we left the talks process, we were ruling the country. All I would say to people who are involved in talks processes is that they should seize that opportunity because it is the power of the mind over the power of muscle that actually wins the day. And I hope that um, all of your political parties seize that opportunity and allow their arguments to prevail. I have proposed that your parliament establish a proper friendship group made up of your members of parliament that all of your members of parliament should be entitled to join that and they should use that as a channel of communication to members of parliament in the United Kingdom. Because you're being sold a huge disservice. Why should international people speak about your country? You have elected people to speak on your behalf. Your elected representatives should be the voice of your country internationally. And it is those elected representatives in your parliament in your government who should be allowed to speak and we're going to hopefully provide them with the platform that their voice will be heard so if there's a, an opposition voice here it should be expressed by the elected representatives who are in the opposition if there's a pro-government voice here it should be expressed and the voice of the, of the elected representative should be heard because we have met many elected representatives and they are good people they are diverse people uh, they're made up of different sections of the community and they represent much more truly anything that anyone internationally can say about your country. And so we hope to facilitate them having their expressed views uh, made known. I would reiterate absolutely the view that I am opposed to sanctions against your country. Sanctions against whom? Sanctions will only damage um, the people that need support. More importantly, if this country as it does rely upon international tourism, it is absolutely crucial that uh, the tourists are allowed to come here and feel safe. And to have sanctions will only drive tourism away. So it is completely counterproductive. And I do not understand why anyone who claims to love this place or claims to be Maldivian at heart why on earth they would want to have sanctions against their country and I, I think we need to make sure that message goes out loud and clear that sanctions would not pose any answer to any question or to any action in this country. Uh, I, I think that it's absolutely important that uh, we develop economic and social links with your country. I know that Mark is going to want to say more about that and, and educational links and, and I'll leave that to him. But one of the things that I, I will say, and I want to be very strong with this, is that our British High Commissioner has a key role to play here. As you know, our, our new High Commissioner has just recently been appointed, James Darris, who's based in Colombo. I will be speaking to him after our visit, and we will be asking him to play a very active role in ensuring that British interests are properly represented here. Everywhere we've gone, people have shaken us by the hand and said, we love the United Kingdom, we love the people of Britain, and therefore we have this mutual respect for each other, and we want to build on that. And uh, I think that our High Commissioner has a role to play in ensuring that he fully understands what's going on on the ground here and reports that back to um, Her Majesty's Government, uh, so as we then can be better informed as a people. And we will certainly be pushing forward uh, for that. Finally, I want to say one thing about uh, security. I sit in the all-parliamentary uh, panel for security, and so I deal with these issues regularly at home. I believe that there is an international threat posed by extremists to all countries, and Maldives is no different in that. Uh, and clearly, there would be people who would seize upon any opportunity to use this country to their advantage. We have an awesome responsibility as uh, people from the United Kingdom to make sure that we give you any support and any help that you require in ensuring that your country is safe. Uh, we have already made that case to the British Foreign Office. 
Uh, we have already made that case to ministers in the United Kingdom. I'm glad that there's been some increase in um, that security advice because it's absolutely essential that no one would be allowed to use this paradise in the middle of the Indian Ocean to do something hellish. And we want to make sure, therefore, that we give you all of the support mm. possible in that regard because it's in our interests. If British people are coming here, they should feel safe. And if we've got information to share with you to allow you to protect your borders and protect your atolls and to protect uh, your country, then we should be sharing that with you. And uh, we will certainly make sure that that is a key message because if you're to go forward, uh, I think that those issues must be addressed. So thank you for taking the time to listen to us. And hopefully when we produce our report, you too will see that we've been very balanced. Yes, outspoken where we need to be outspoken, but very fair to the people of this country because this is a wonderful place. And sometimes when you live somewhere, you don't realise how wonderful a country you have. I love my country. I think it's the best place in the world. But you know something? You're pretty close to it. Hmm. And uh, so therefore, you know, you should be very, very proud of your country and recognise that the crossroads you're on is very, very important. And you, the people, can help take it forward. Thank you. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to fully endorse the words of my colleagues, uh, Sir uh, David, and, and particularly what Ian's just said recently about terrorism, about what we as the United Kingdom uh, can and must do in order to keep you safe. British people travel the world. British people can choose to go anywhere. Many of them choose to come to the Maldives because it is a safe place to come it is a beautiful place to come. It is a place where British people for generations have been made to feel welcome. But there are some people out there uh, who would seek to disrupt and to destroy the Maldivian tourist-based economy. And we must never allow that to happen. We as the people of the Maldives, we as the people of the United Kingdom. And so therefore, I hope that if any requests for security uh, advice or assistance is received from your government uh, to our government that that advice is forthcoming and I believe that um, there is already uh, work in place there. But the thing that I want to focus on primarily is about the, the future and the prosperity of Maldivian people, particularly young Maldivian people. We were taken on our first day out to the island that has been reclaimed, is it Humali? Humali. Uh, and you know, we saw the, some of the plans there, you know, both in terms of for housing, for economic development and for educational development. And it's just an idea. But one of the thoughts that, um, that we've had on this visit is to suggest uh, to United Kingdom Trade and Investment, who've already made it very clear that they will do what they can to help Maldives to improve British commercial investment, and economic links to your country, but to suggest to them that a good starting point would be to encourage United Kingdom educational institutions to look at establishing a base on Humali, looking primarily at leisure, tourism and the hospitality trade. And that's something that we United Kingdom do very well. And maybe an institution that starts off very small with, you know, a, the first few years maybe you know quite a modest beginning but gives the young Maldivian people an opportunity to become highly skilled to increase their earning opportunities and not rely on external people coming in to tell you how to run your hotels skill you up so you can run your own hotels and it's not just about doing you know the lowest jobs in the sector it is about adding value, adding wealth creation, and having the opportunity not just to do that in the Maldives, but to go across the region and for young people to, to, to become uh, good and, and trained and skilled at that. And, but in order to do that, you need some help and assistance and a, and a, and a proper quality uh, facility, uh, which United Kingdom can help you to do and in the early years in a modest way, but to build out on that, that is something that we would like to try and encourage. The Maldives is a country that, as uh, Ian and David have both said, is at a crossroads at the moment. And I came here never having been before, and 
uh, but had been hearing reports in the media which concerned me. I think some of those reports were a misrepresentation of what I have experienced on the ground. And that's not what I've been experienced as being told by your government. You know, I am uh, independent minded, I speak my mind, but I am also not stupid. So I can see things, and we've met with the opposition parties, we've spoken to all the Maldivian people, we've even watched your TV programmes in the evening when we've been uh, back at our hotel here in Mali. And so we see that you are um, a free and a fair media. You know, you're not people that are cowed into saying what the government wants you to say. You know, you will criticise the government, you will put forward your own views. I believe that from what I have experienced, that journalism um, is, is alive and well in this country, and long may that continue. But what we want to ensure is that a small number of people, be they NGOs with a particular viewpoint, um, people that are celebrity lawyers, uh, or you know, those who have a, a particular gripe with the government, that their view is not held, heard in a disproportionate way to counter views. But, and, and the best way for that to happen is for the Maldivian people to make their voice heard. It's not for us to, to argue the case on your behalf. It is for the Maldivian people, your elected parliamentarians, and also the journalistic community within the Maldives to make, to make your views heard. You know, as, as a group of journalists, you do not need international journalists writing about your country and telling the world about what your country is about. You are more than capable of doing that yourselves. And it's important that you do that, both the good, the bad, the things that are going well, the things you'd like to change. And that is something that we would like to help encourage. And the friendship group that Ian has, has talked about, that, you know, that, that will only work if it is balanced, if, if, if it's got representation from all the political parties. And there'll be things that people within that friendship group disagree about. That is what democracy looks like. In our own parliament, we, we will discuss things and we will have a range of views, not just within uh, parliament from opposition parties, but within our own party. I will disagree with colleagues from my Conservative Party about some of the, the, the views that they, they hold. That is what democracy looks like. And you know, you're a young country, you're a young democracy, and it's very important that external organisations, often meaning well, do not try and force their views upon you, but they are there to seek to help, to assist, to advise. And that is something that I hope that our report uh, which we have not written yet, but you know we are all determined that it is balanced and, it, and reflects our views from what we have seen. We are determined that that report is something that we will hopefully share with people and they can make of it as they wish. But uh, it's been our pleasure to visit Mali and uh, once again I thank the Maldivian people for making us feel very welcome. And when we walked about the streets yesterday, uh, you know, it was, it was great to see just ordinary people going about their business. We, they probably thought we were, you know, strange people, you know, dressed like this. You know, what was, uh, yes, it was a very, very hot day. Uh, but, uh, you know, thank you. And, uh, you know, we look forward to any questions that you may have for us. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. We've spoken for, at you for a long time. Now it's over to your good selves. Questions on anything and everything, yeah? Michael Nassim from Radio TV. Uh, is it true that your trip to the Maldives was substantially funded by the Maldivian government? The visit to the Maldives was by the... We requested it. The Maldives Foreign Office obviously um, uh, made those arrangements for us. Um, yes, they paid for it. Um, that does not question our judgment. More importantly, it does not um, indicate in any way that we're in their pocket. Um, I think uh, you've already heard some of the things that we've said. And just following on from that, ideally, we didn't want to be sponsored by the government. I tried to get sponsorship. In the British Parliament, we had the CPA, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, and the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union. I tried to get it done through them, but they said there wasn't enough time. And as you know, at the moment in the UK, we're just about to have this three or four month period when we're going to be debating about the European Union. 
and because things are built to a crisis here, there was just no alternative. Yeah. So ideally, we did not want to be sponsored by uh, the government, but there just wasn't anyone else offering to do it. So was there any involvement of the British Parliament in your visit? Yes. Because, oh. uh, the opposition party, NDP, has claimed that they only received the message about your visit through the foreign ministry and not through the British Parliament. Oh, well, let me read a letter from um, our foreign office. Um, and this was dated the 30th of January, because we've been planning this visit for some time. It's from Hugo Swire to Sir David as chairman of the group. And he's thanking us for our letter and for our interest in uh, taking the Maldives group to the Maldives in February. And he says, I am pleased to hear of your visit. And I have asked that officials from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, to contact you directly and to arrange with briefings and provide a full uh, list of opposition and NGO contacts whom you can visit. So we publicised it. We wanted to meet all the people who were not happy with the uh, government. I mean, we're happy to do that. So, for instance, a little later, uh, not really an issue for your your good selves. I'll be going to um, Global City, where there are some issues with the development there, and there are British investors, they, they want us to meet here. But it was absolutely yeah. transparent, yeah. our visit here, yeah. and we're happy to meet anyone and, yeah. and everyone. And if I could just add on to that, uh, the NDP, in theory, is the Conservative Party sister party. Some of my Conservative MP colleagues in an earlier election came out to help the NDP. And so, you know, so I'm disappointed if they think that you know, the, the, there is any sort of anti-MBD MBD agenda going on here, that just simply is not, not the case. If there was, we would not have requested, in fact insisted, on meeting them. And we had a very uh, open and frank meeting with them yesterday. In fact, we told them about um, this press conference today. You know, so the, the reason they know about that is because we told them about that. You know, so you know, we have got no agenda. Um, we whatsoever. insisted that yeah. we met all political parties, and three weeks ago, I'd never met him before. Your deputy speaker contacted me in Westminster, came to my parliamentary office, and he put his case about the MDP, which sort of shocked me. Uh, I'd never met the gentleman before, but you know, he was he was saying some things which were in total. Um, different, uh, the, totally different to things that we had been told back in the UK, so. I mean, I, I think the issue of sponsorship is a, a fair question, but I think you've got to ask yourself three questions. British members of parliament would not sponsor, or could not fund a trip or a visit like this, take the time to do that. Um, we're not paid to do this, so we do this during our recess. Um, secondly, uh, if your government had something to hide, the last thing it wants is certainly people like me, David and Mark to be sitting here poking our nose into everything. Um, so, you know, I think hats off to the fact that your foreign ministry decided that we'll allow this group to come here. Um, and uh, as David and Mark both reiterated, we insisted in saying we mm. will determine whom we meet. Mm. You help us meet those people. Mm. And so if the, the implication is but somehow we're in someone's pockets because your government paid for it. Actually, your government has a duty to help express itself internationally, and so part of that duty is to bring visits here. And um, as you know, last week I think it brought a visit of MEPs also, and that will have received some support from your government, though a lot of the support would come from Europe. So, David, how do you, how do you foresee the inter party talk, especially after the Well, uh, the three of us were taken aback by what the President told us this morning because, look, I, I don't want to make the situation more difficult, but when we met the MDP yesterday, they said that they were very keen on these all-party talks and they certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, they never said the condition would be that all prisoners had to be released before these talks took place. I, I don't recall no, that, that being I, said. I, I did a talks process from 1997 until uh, 2009 and uh, at no point did anyone in our country ask for the 2,000 prisoners to be released in advance of the talks. After the talks, 
part of the agreement was the release of prisoners. That was terrorist prisoners. And if they had Adam. told us that, so, you, you know, see, that, yesterday. That was a condition there. So in normal processes, the, the, those things come after. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, so that was never said. And listen, talking is the best way here. Absolutely. And if we had been told that by the MDP yesterday, we, we would have challenged them on, on it. You know, you can't have preconditions. So that, that was disappointing, really. I, I don't know who it is who was responsible for that. But the president said he wanted international observers at these talks. I mean, he'll open up everything, for goodness sake. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous now, frankly. And I say again, it's Maldivian people who are suffering as a result of all this. That's the point. Damage is being done to your tourism and your standing in the rest of the world. That's the way I feel about it. Yes, sir? Um, what is your response to the British economy's uh, reaction to the current political situation here and others, uh, especially about the commission and uh, sentencing of the former well, president, uh, his medical leave, and also uh, we saw last week, uh, earlier this year, uh, the conviction and sentencing of I think there's a couple of points I would say. First of all, I think our government has a duty to put the interests of our people first, not the interests of its individual relationships first. And I am concerned that um, the... Um, I mean, Mr Nasheed was president and he visited the United Kingdom. The party leader of the Conservative Party did not meet him. He was not brought to Downing Street then. But after he's been convicted in this country for serious crimes, and they're currently in the middle of a due process, he is fated in Downing Street. Now that sends out a, a, a bit of a, a message to um, people, especially here in the Maldives, uh, quite a confused message. And I think our government has a responsibility to be uh, more circumspect in, it, in its view. So I, I would say to Mr Cameron, he has the invitation now to meet with um, the President of the Maldives. He should take that opportunity and those views should be expressed then behind closed doors about what they really think and how they want to take the country forward. I um, believe that Mr uh, Nasheed has every right to express his views, uh, uh, but if there are things standing over him that need to be answered, he needs to face them in this country. We can't interfere in the domestic affairs and in the due process of law in this country. And I think people have got to realise that. Um, do we provide you with a list of all the people who must never be prosecuted in this country because it suits us internationally? That's crass. That's not acceptable. You have a responsibility. You are mature enough as a people. You know if the process is wrong and is unfair. And you've got to go through a due process. And I think that we should be supporting that and encouraging that. And if there's ways in which we can improve it by supplying you with better advice or better, better attorneys, if that is what is sought, or or other opportunities, certainly we should cooperate with you. But to tell you who to jail and not jail, that's not our business. Uh, put the, the shoe in the other foot. We have a, 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 if, if we had a situation where there was someone in jail and an international country contacted us and said, you must release them because we know that person personally, I don't think people in the United Kingdom would take that too well. And I think they would tell you where to go and put that mm. position. And I think, therefore, we need to uh, respect your independence as a country. Support you, encourage you, challenge you where we think you can do things better, but leave these issues to yourselves. Yeah. Um, There's a lady here first. I'll go back. I think that's on the table. Well, you have well, one of the people who has just been jailed it was not actually a member of parliament, I understand. He was a political leader. I didn't think any of the party you know, leaders were in jail. You know, the, 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 the all party talks, I think, should involve people who are elected to office. And, uh, you know, you've got members of parliament. We, we met a, a very, very articulate uh, woman member of parliament yesterday from the A. What's it called? Um, um, uh, she's mm. a single member of parliament. Yeah. It's on your list. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, a bell a party? A Della? Della party? A Della um, party. I would have absolute confidence in that woman being able to represent the views and interests of her party at an all-party talks process. She was incredibly articulate. She made her views known. Uh, she made them known in a very precise way. I may not have agreed with those views. I may have agreed with some of them, as we have alleged. Um, and indeed, all of the MPs who we met from all of the parties, I believe, are capable people. And uh, they should be making this case. And if the president is offering talks, my advice the opportunity, seize it, use it, and prove your worth as an elect representative. Yes, sir. Sir, President Yamin last year had publicly said after uh, the leader who was jailed on February 16, leader Sheikh Ibrahim Brown of the Adala Party, after he gave a speech uh, in a rally linking President Yamin to the murder of uh, late MP Afrashim, President Yamin had said that he would bring out criminal charges against Imran uh, for the speech he gave at the rally. And currently, de the defamation is not a criminal offense in the Maldives. And soon later, Imran was charged with uh, terrorism, and he's been subsequently convicted uh, and given a 12-year jail sentence. Do you not think that this trial is politically motivated? But well, what I think of it, whether it's political or not political, really doesn't count. What is important is the due process of law in your country. And um, if he's gone through full due process of law, and if he's had a fair trial... But Ian, hang, that, hang that, on that, for that a moment. He told us about all the petrol he had. Yes, well, 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 well come to me. I, I'm saying we could make views known about what we have heard and briefings that we have received. Right, because we've just been what, told... What is that there is that there has been due process of law. And if there's an appeal mechanism, mechanism up to it, he should do it. What we have to avoid is us telling you who you should have in jail and who you should not have in jail. That, you may as well not have your, your, your governance then at all. It is for your people to determine these things. And we need to be very cautious about pointing the finger and saying, let this man out of jail because this technical point is not, not right. We can, we've asked 16 questions. A couple of the questions are about your process of law and due process. We expect to get answers on that. I think the fact that we're asking the questions reflects that we need to see good answers. But the main point is, these are matters for you to determine. They're not for us to point the finger and say, keep him in jail or let him out of jail. That makes us dictators, and we're Democrats. But you do understand that Maldives has international obligations, and as a member of the Commonwealth, yes. do you not feel that freedom of expression is a value you need to uphold? and Imran was sentenced based merely on a speech. So do you not think that this trial was politically motivated? And do you not think that Modi should uphold its international obligations to ensure freedom of expression? Of course it should uphold its international obligations, but all of the evidence that we have seen does not indicate that this was just solely a matter about a minor speech, that there were issues expressed that incited violence. And there were issues expressed which uh, were involved in your terrorist law also. And, uh, you know, I, I think with, without going into a complete discourse of all of the briefings that we have received, I think you know that the case is not very simple. And that it's, uh, <coughs> if it was that simple, uh, then we would have easy answers for you. Gentlemen? Yes. yes. Now, uh, since you talked about the Irish Republic and uh, also the United Kingdom. And there was uh, a question I have put on this you know, parliamentary union, I don't know if that's European parliamentary, about Julian Assange. Mm. What, as lawmakers, what have you done to help him to go to Ecuador where he likes to go? I think the guy's an absolute disgrace. Mm. Absolute disgrace, and I, as a British taxpayer, yeah. bitterly resent the two million pounds keeping this idiot in that property. The guy is gutless, and he should be go and face trial mm. and meet his accusers in terms of rape. I've got no time for Julian Assange. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I would tend to endorse uh, what uh, Sir David has said. It is very, very important 
that, you know, Sweden, for goodness sake, is one of the world's foremost democracies, very sophisticated judicial system. Uh, no one can accuse Sweden of being, you know, some sort of despotic regime. The man is facing very serious allegations. He should have the courage uh, and go and face uh, his accusers in a Swedish court. And, and anything other than that, I think, is an absolute sham and a disgrace. M man's, a, you know, well, we know what he is. He's an idiot and um, a very expensive idiot, yeah. frankly. And, and it's, it's, it's rather disappointing that people give him uh, currency which he does not deserve. If anyone else was accused of a charge as serious as rape, uh, they would be expected to stand trial. But they to would, be given immunity yeah, under those circumstances yeah. is ridiculous. It's, it's not in favour of So I, I think, I think it's, um, it's important that you know, he goes through a uh, proper judicial process. And I can think of no fairer country than Sweden uh, who are uh, the people that wish to, to speak with him. And I think it's important that... I mean, who does he think is the Pope appearing on the balcony? We, we have laid down a marker today that it's for your country to determine your domestic issues. Mm. I think you're hearing an expression today that it's for our country to resolve its domestic issues and not to be dictated to by Europe or by others on, on, on these key issues of law and the enforcement of law. Now, it's not in Mr. Julian Assange's um, interests um, economically, socially or physically to be held up in a basement in any embassy office in London. Uh, and I think that, as Mark has rightly said, where he is wanted for in a Western democracy, he, uh, we have a little saying, let the hidden things of darkness come to light. And if there is something that he's trying to hide, his ac actions seem to indicate that. If he is prepared to let everything be in the light, and expose everything. And his agenda was about freedom, about transparency, about letting people see evidence. Well, let's see the evidence about this case. And if he is innocent, as he claims to be, I believe he will receive a fair trial and will be let out. If he is not innocent, if there's strong evidence against him, he will have to face the music there. Well, um, fair enough. How clear is that? As long as from British uh, government here, Today, with, with us, you have spoken with our economic minister, with, with, with any, any minister here. But what have you learned from our parliamentarians, our lawmakers, oppositions, or the, the, the government uh, party members? What, what, what have you learned from them? What, what, what did you get from the opposition? Well, all political parties actually praised the present regime for economic regeneration. Now that sort of took us back a bit, did, didn't it, gentlemen? But they all thought that the government was going the right way. I think this president particularly uh, focused on young people and ladies' rights, and all the political parties seemed to feel that the economy was on the up and good things were happening. So I think our talks with um, all the political parties didn't really get into world affairs if that's what you meant they didn't they didn't raise any issues with us it was just g generally uh, how domestically they, they, they looked for some support in terms of can we attract further investments from UK investors from world investors mm -hmm. uh, Mark has gone into some detail in his earlier statement about the opportunity for an educational um, link up um, we've seen this happening very well in Shanghai with some of our universities. We've seen it happening in other countries where there's outposts of British universities. And we think that's a very positive mm. option. The MPs from all parties saw that as something that they could support. It's up to us now to come back mm. and, uh, with, with hopefully concrete proposals on that from UKTI yeah. and from some of the universities. Yeah. And, and also, th I, don't think it's, I, don't, I don't think it's accurate um, for some of some external people to describe Maldives as a high-risk country to invest in. Were that the case, you would not have seen substantial investment from some of the world's major international hotel chains who can go anywhere, but they have chosen to come to Maldives for, for very, very clear reasons. And I think it's important that um, help and assistance is given on a government-to-government -government level to ease the path 
of companies and organisations such as a university who may wish to invest in the Maldives because that ultimately is to the benefit of the Maldivian people. International capital is highly mobile. It can go anywhere it, that, it, that it chooses. There is important arguments as to why it should come to the Maldives, none less than your blessed and your geographical position. You know, you are off the coast of India, you know, one of the, the BRIC countries, uh, and you have you know, good command uh, of uh, you know, the, the English language, which for international companies, that, that is very, very important. You know, because it, you know, English is, uh, you know, f thankfully for me, because I cannot speak any other language, it, English is you know, the international business language. And <coughs> it's important that you know, we do everything that we can in order to encourage the British government uh, through United Kingdom Trade and Investment to help British organisations uh, to at least come and look at the Maldives. They may come and look at the Maldives and decide that they want to invest somewhere else, fine, that's their choice. But, but something like an educational facility, uh, focus around tourism, leisure, hospitality, I think would be a really interesting place to begin because it's important that Maldives has a stable, uh, bright, prosperous future. And by focusing on what comes next in terms of improving our relationships um, between the United Kingdom and the Maldives, your place within the Commonwealth, that surely is to the benefit, particularly of young Maldivian people. Instability, lack of investment, sanctions, portraying you as a dangerous and bad place, that is not in the interests of young Maldivian people. And so again, I would urge caution on people that are we use the phrase blow-ins. They sort of blow in from outside and then they blow back out again with an agenda. Uh, I would urge those people to be very cautious as to how they portray the Maldives. Um, if you're a celebrity lawyer, you can go anywhere in order to apply your celebrity trade. Don't seek to do down the Maldives in order to try and advance your celebrity cause because it's ordinary Maldivian people that will suffer and pay a price when you're getting changed insulators frock in your Sunseeker yacht. It is other people who will be paying that price, and so I would urge people to behave in a very measured and modest way. I should add that we were very impressed with the calibre of all your elected parliamentarians. We found them very articulate. They spoke about mm -hmm. the islands they represented, they spoke about how they represent the constituents. When we met the PPM, I can't remember his name, but there was one gentleman who used to be MDP who changed to the PPM. And then we met another lady who represents the Maldives yeah, like. yeah. from the Commonwealth thing. Well, anyway, they, they were all very, very impressive of all the political yeah. parties. We were slightly frustrated. We wanted to see your parliament in session They'd met the previous day before, seven bills had had their first reading and with the President, it was very unfortunate on the day that we would go there, we couldn't see the House in, in session, but uh, anyway, we yeah. were given a tour of the building and we met your Speaker who was also very impressive. Yeah. Again, if we could just add to that, you know, th this press conference in itself is a symbol of a democratic process. None of you have been asking us patsy questions. Uh, you've been asking us probing questions. We, I think, have given uh, our views, fairly robust answers. So, you know, anyone who thinks that either we are some sort of put up, or that you, as a group of journalists, are mouthpieces of the government, uh, I think would be very, very wrong on both occasions. You've asked us probing questions. We have given honest answers. Uh, and we've you know, given an indication of some of the things that we will try and do to follow up and, and, and to, to shed a light on it. But ultimately, as, as Ian and David have, have both said, you have got very capable politicians within the Maldives who are elected by your people. That is who should be championing the cause of the Maldives, both but whether they're from the government side or from the opposition side. That is why they need to take part in all party talks without lots and lots of preconditions on board. That is why the media in this country need to be the voice of the Maldives, not relying on a celebrity lawyer uh, to go around and, and tell people what they should be thinking. You're more than capable of doing that and I hope 
uh, you know, the, the international community begin to recognise that and give you a bit more, a bit more of, 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 of a credibility than perhaps some people have been doing up until now. And just to nail the very first question that we were asked about our sponsorship, the idea that those who have a contrary view to us are not sponsored is ridiculous. They're not paying to travel to all these places out of their own pockets. They're sponsored by people. I mean, that is what, what happens. So you can argue that whoever is advocating a case is sponsored by someone. I say again, I would prefer that we did this under the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association or the IPU. It wasn't possible. But for goodness sake, mm. we said we would meet anyone and everyone. And yeah. all the criticisms, whether it be the number of political prisoners, the number of terrorists, freedom of worship, all those things we're going to deal with. Yeah. And when we get back to Parliament, we're going to have a debate about the Maldives, which Ian is going to lead. And during that debate, we will raise all these issues in the mother of all parliaments. Uh, and we'll also be telling David Cameron that the president would be very keen to meet him. So ladies and gentlemen, are we all done or? Yeah, I, oh. I, I, have one, I have one more question. Which okay. It's not going to be about Donald Trump no, or no, Hillary it's Clinton. Trump or, it's not about a celebrity. But as parliamentarians, you are from the British Parliament, mm -hmm. you would say. And uh, now, how, how fair is it, you think, as lawmakers? Now, the government has the parliament majority, and the constitution is being amended, and there have been changes, which relates to the rest of people, to the, uh, the prosecution of some people, and then still, uh, you are talking about economics of the models. If your visit here, it's about the, the market publicity of the models. What's the parliament body is doing? How, how, could, how, how could it then be, how can it be improved? But, well, your, your parliament has been, if you like, short-changed in that it's not been allowed to express internationally the views of the people that send the MPs to the parliament. And that's why we've made it very clear, all three of us, that internationally the first Port of call for the press should be your members of parliament, and they should be allowed to express their views because the views that are being given and the views that we are hearing, they are controversial in some areas, but they're also expressed by people who are elected representatives. Uh, and you know, as journalists, you should be saying to your peers in the international world, you know, when you come here to do a story or if you want to get a, some comment, talk first to the MPs, and that's one of the things which which we were doing and uh, I think it's beneficial. I mean, when we were in the prison, for example, we just didn't talk to the governor. We walked around and talked to prisoners. Yeah. We went into their cells. They weren't expecting this. We went into their cells and Well, we joined in with the game of football. <laughs> yeah, there was a game of football going on with some of the prisoners. We, we chatted yeah. to the guys playing football. So, you know, nothing was held back from us, and we didn't allow it to be held back from us. Yeah. And I think, you know, th there's a positive story for your, for your government and for your people and for your elected representatives to tell, and they should be allowed to tell. Yeah. Now, we will have to make this the last question, and it's not that we're not enjoying this, but we've got the meeting with the Environment and Energy Minister and the Chief Justice, which we're now overrunning for. So. Since you mentioned that journalism is alive and well in the Maldives, I wanted to ask you if you're aware that uh, a TV station was burnt down in 2013, a journalist was beaten up and nearly killed in 2013. <coughs> a journalist has been abducted in 2014. Two TV stations have been threatened that their licenses would be revoked. And a documentary shown by my TV station has been banned earlier this week. So do you think that these are indicative of a healthy atmosphere for journalism? Could we burn the television station? Nobody has been held accountable for any of these crimes. So we don't know who burned it down? No. Do you know who burned it down? We, we have suspects. Have you reported it to the police? See, yes. I, I, perhaps I'm being naive. I can't see the logic in that. Because if what you're saying has happened, that's drawn attention to it all, really. It's outrage. Would you send me details of what you've just described to us and I would get an answer so that we didn't know anything about it at all? 
and I'll try and find out about that. You have my word on that. Thank well, thank you. you all very much indeed. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. You're much nicer than the British.